Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll give a chance for Marshall to introduce himself. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. Uh, one of the trap support specialists here with Big Brig. Um, if you call in the support line, dial extension to, um, he's the man you'll get on the other end. Uh, you want to give us a little info, Marshall? Hey, guys. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Marshall. Uh, like Ryan said, I'm uh, the other trap support specialist. Uh, I guess if you guys have any questions after this webinar um, that don't get answered, um, feel free to give me a call tomorrow. Okay, uh, I'm Ryan Rokes with Pig Brig. A um, little bit about my background. Uh, I graduated uh, from Purdue University back in the mid 90s. Uh, my first project out of school was working on a feral pig and goat eradication program uh, out on Catalina Island in California. Um, since then, I've been involved in uh, mostly eradication efforts um, on island environments, Santa Cruz, uh, and efforts ongoing in Guam. So uh, that's a little bit about my background, um, specifically focused in uh, making sure that we understand how we're going to remove the last pig before we're going to remove the very first one. So uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, today's topic should be pretty interesting for everybody. It's a question that we get asked a lot. Um, you know, what we recommend for bait. Uh, and so um, the information's pretty basic uh, as far as what the recommendation, the specific recommendation is, but there's a lot of nuance to it. So uh, we'll get started this evening. If you have questions or something's not covered um, thoroughly enough, certainly shoot a um, question to us in the Q&A. Marshall will be tallying those up this evening. And then uh, we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can this evening. Uh, during the last webinar, we were able to cover all the, the questions that um, the participants had. So uh, that was great. And um, as, as we had said, if there was something that hasn't been covered in tonight's webinar, we didn't get to it during the Q&A. If you want to give us a call tomorrow, 833-744-2744, uh, Extension two gets us to trap support, which is uh, either Marshall or I. So we'll get started here. And once again, any questions, just, just drop them in that Q&A box. Why is it not allowing me to move forward? Okay, so when we look at the keys to successful baiting of pigs, uh, there's some things that are really important to keep in mind. Uh, one is that you have to be patient. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge that we see as trap support specialists for pig rig. A lot of the calls that we get in, um, you know, somebody sees pigs on their property, they dump out a bag of bait and pigs aren't on that right away. And people are wondering why, um, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of time for pigs to acclimate to bait. Um, and you need to be mindful of of what else is going around on, on your property, neighboring properties. Um, but in general, it, it just takes a lot of time for pigs to actually get acclimated to bait and feeding on it regularly. So uh, being patient is the very, very first key um, to being successful. The second is be consistent. So whatever you start doing, um, you know, you want to continue that process throughout your baiting and trapping efforts. Uh, what we typically see is the pigs don't react as fast as uh, the trapper would like. So their first reaction is to try to change something to speed up that process. And what you in essence end up doing is creating change so that the pigs are reacting to the change so they don't acclimate to the bait as quick as possible. Um, so be consistent on whatever you're doing. If you're driving up to the bait and you're side by side, continue to drive up to the bait and the side by side. Don't change to a pickup or your motorbike or you know sending your kids out there. Whatever it is that you're doing, you want to be consistent in the approach. Um, and then be mindful of whatever natural food resources are available. You know, are the pecans, uh, hickories, and acorns dropping from the trees? If they are, you know, that's going to be detrimental to your, your ability to leverage bait for successful trapping, right? Are you during peanut harvest? 
another time that's going to be extremely difficult to get pigs on bait is the nutgrass blooming. Um, maybe farmers and ranchers are, you know, putting seed in the ground, whether it's, it's you know, wheat seed or uh, cereal crop seed. Just be mindful of those things and try to appreciate how that's going to impact um, those pigs finding your bait and then utilizing it, right? If there's all kinds of natural uh, food resources available, what is the incentive to prefer your, your bait over others? Um, you know, if, if they're feeding on acorns, it's going to be really, really difficult to get them to feed on anything else. Um, and then cameras are a good addition. Are they 100% necessary? No, they're not. Um, but we utilize camera data extensively to understand what's going on. Um, how, much, how much bait are the pigs consuming? How many non-targets are you dealing with? Are there a bunch of raccoons coming in? Do you have deer feeding on it? Um, peccaries, we had, well, I think it's been a while, but we had an alligator show up on a bait pile <laughs> on one of, the, uh, one of the posts on the owner's group. So the cameras are a good addition and it doesn't mean that you need to have an expensive um, cellular-based camera. You can get just a regular SD card-based camera. You can pick up a decent camera uh, we have a recommended list on our website, you know, for as cheap as 50 bucks. And, you know, it'll get you the data that you need to better understand um, how those animals are interacting with your bait site and what adjustments you may need to make uh, in order to be successful. So, you know, it, when we look at this, we need to assess the situation. Each situation is unique. Um, a lot of the rules apply across the board to pig trapping but there's some slight differences depending on where you're located in the country. Are you working on an island environment? Are you working in uh, heavy agriculture? Are you um, in a ranching environment, barrier island? You know, these things are important. And so you need to take the time to assess what's going on. Um, again, the, the camera recon is very helpful, right? A lot of us will know if you know you have a food plot for deer, and the pigs are going in there because the nut grass is ripe and they're tearing up your field. You know that, but it's good to be able to quantify um, how many pigs you're dealing with, right? One pig can do a tremendous amount of damage. Are you dealing with a sounder of 20 pigs or do you have one boar that's, you know, running through there like a moldboard plow? Uh, those things are important to understand uh, and the camera allows you to do that. Also, you know, do your best to identify bedding and feeding areas. You know, uh, Aaron Summerall, Dr. Summerall uses a great analogy. Um, you know, we, we attempt to put our bait in corridors. You don't wanna drop it in their bedroom and you don't wanna drop it in their kitchen. Um, you know, if you go through and make changes in those two areas, it's very noticeable. Uh, changes are less noticeable in those transition areas. So if you can identify where the animals are bedding and where they're feeding, um, you have an advantage of, you know, locating your bait uh, in an area where it's going to be uh, most readily utilized and it's not going to put those animals off. Um, as we've discussed before, how many sounders and pigs? And, and then um, what is the mix of those? Are there, you know, breeding pigs and boars present? If you have one big boar present and a bunch of sows with piglets, you're likely not going to get get all of those to show up at the bait at one time. The breeding sows with, you know, little shoats aren't gonna show up when there's a boar present. You know, the, the risk is too high. Um, and then are feral, feral hogs seen during the daylight? You know, it's not often that we get to see pigs feeding during the day, um, but it does happen. And you need to understand that if you get pigs on bait during daylight hours and you set a trap up there, uh, you may be clearing your trap in the daylight. And so that information is good to know and understand um, how you're baiting, right? Uh, one of the techniques that we use is, is typically we're trying to place our bait later in the evening um, so that that minimizes some of the non-target issues. But if you're seeing pigs on your bait site at 12 in the afternoon um, and they're waiting for you for six or eight hours, uh, maybe you want to move that up. So understanding how the the, the pigs are using the, the bait itself and the property is, is good information to have. 
and then land compensation and management, um, you know, how much food resources are available? Are you on a feedlot and uh, there's a lot of spillage going on and the pigs are feeding on spillage from, uh, you know, your livestock feed, you know, are farmers planting? Um, those are all going to impact how much you bait, how successful you're going to be, and how long it's going to take for those animals to be acclimated. Uh, is the property managed for crops or livestock? You know, if you're pre-planting season, uh, food resources are limited, you're probably going to get deer, or not deer, sorry, pigs on bait relatively fast. Your biggest challenge is going to be keeping deer off bait because the, the food resources are limited for those as well. Um, you know, and, and we have techniques to, to be able to do that. Um, we'll highlight those in the upcoming, I guess it'll be next month's October's webinar, but, um, you know, understanding how the property is managed or which, which part of the rotation are you in with livestock? You know, it's ideally you're putting your trap in before or after the rotation of livestock in that paddock. So understanding that and what the, what the, you know, feeding, um, timing is of that livestock. Are you pouring grain to finishing cattle um, and are pigs feeding on that? And how is that gonna impact your ability to um, leverage pigs to your bait? And what about water resources, right? This is gonna be an important one, especially with some of the droughts that they're dealing with uh, in many parts of the country, right? Georgia, not so much where um, Marshall's at, he seemed to be swimming most of the summer, but where Aaron was over in Texas, it was super dry, right? And if you're a long ways from water and you wondered where your pigs went, well, the likelihood is, is that they're in those bottoms where they have access to fresh water. Um, they'll also use, you know, stock tanks. So if there's stock tanks out there, you're gonna have some pigs around, but if you had a bunch of sounders running through your property, you put out bait and all of a sudden they disappeared, but it's dry as a bone, um, there's high likelihood that they're, you know, down in those bottoms where there's some water. And then is there any feral hog mitigation going on on your place or on the neighbor's properties, right? If the neighbors are running dogs every third night and blowing the sounders up, um, even though that may not be happening on your property, it's going to impact your ability to get pigs to bait, right? There's negative interaction going on in some place that's very proximate and that's going to have a direct impact. It's also how much of those pigs been shot over bait, right? A lot of places, you know, by the time you get to the point where you're completely fed up, there's been some mitigation efforts in place. You know, maybe you've used other traps in the past. And so um, they're wise to a trapping effort, you know, and obviously that effort used bait. So there have some shyness to bait doesn't mean that you can't lure them to bait. It just means that it's going to take longer and you need to be more patient. So uh, kind of think about that. And again, it's not just what happened on your place, unless your, your spread's big enough where, you know, you have resident hog populations that aren't going off property. Um, most people, the hogs are not restricted to your property and, and they could be um, experiencing some sort of mitigation efforts on neighboring properties. And then what about non-target species? Are they present, right? Do you have collared peccaries, have a lean on the property? Um, you know, deer are the big ones. Raccoons are obviously the big ones and probably um, to a lesser extent bears. So those are kind of the three big ones that we have to deal with. Um, you know, and we have techniques that we can use at our disposal to mitigate those. A lot of times you're not going to completely eliminate non-targets, but um, you can reduce the amount of loss that you're having in bait to those non-targets, right? By using an application of, um, you know, like liquid fence on your bait for deer, um, putting an escape route in for um, raccoons or, um, you know, working with bears, either with electric fences or, you know, um, some sort of hot pepper uh, to minimize the amount of activity that you have at, at your bait site. So uh, some things to think about. And then time of year, right? It's like we have seasonal effects that we know happen in most places, right? You have your winter trapping season when likely 
um, you're going to have the best bait leverage uh, because natural food resources are the most limiting. So, you know, those are the time to really, you know, make hay, right? You're going to, the sun shining and you want to stack it up because that's going to be your highest opportunity to leverage that bait. Um, spring and fall, those are more difficult times, right? You have not a lot of natural food resources available um, from agricultural plantings um, and then just mother nature, right? Whether it's, it's your mass crops that are uh, becoming ripe or uh, things are just blooming and right tubers are ripe or your nut grass is, is blooming. So um, be mindful of those things and then think about how that impacts you, right? It's like if you're, a lot of people become frustrated when you get your uh, food plot into the ground, if you're running a deer lease and next thing you know, the pigs come plowing through there. Well, you know, you may have just planted. And so you've got a whole field full of basically food for the pigs and um, not only you, but all of your neighbors as well. So just because you plop out a, a pile of corn doesn't necessarily mean that those pigs are gonna lock right onto that because there's a lot of food resource available. Um, again, doesn't mean that you can't get them onto the bait. It just means that uh, it's gonna take some patience to get there. And then setting the table, you know, what are, be aware of local and regional food preferences. Um, you know, when we look at some of the areas, so look at peanut producing areas, we know that in those, those areas, um, you're gonna have, especially when the, the peanut crop is right, you're gonna have a slight preference for peanuts, right? That's what they're naturally feeding on. Um, another one that really stands out is uh, the work that we do on Guam. They feed a lot on coconut, right? And so we know in order to get the, the pigs transitioned over from coconut to shell corn, um, we use coconut milk, right? So think about what are the local or regional food preferences um, and you can kind of tailor your bait to that. It doesn't mean that you can't get them to um, feed on something other than that. It's just that they may have a slight preference for those uh, food resources. And so, you know, you may want to key your bait into that. Um, and then, as we mentioned earlier, trap between the bedding and feeding areas. Um, if you go in and change something in somebody's living room, right, their, their um, living room or kitchen, uh, an area where it's highly noticeable, um, you may disrupt their activities, right? Same for their bedding area. You don't want to go in there and change that. But if you use a transition zone, think of that as a hallway in your house, um, you can make minor adjustments in somebody's pictures on the wall in their uh, hallway they're not gonna notice and pigs are similar. So you wanna to try to get your baits in, a, in that transition zone. And then, uh, you know, Aaron really stresses this. Don't force the pigs to do what you want. You know, read what's happening and respond to their behavior, right? And so a lot of times we'll run bait trials. Uh, you know where that corridor is and we may put out bait in five or six different areas. Um, and in those five or six different areas, generally the pigs will show a preference to one of those bait sites. Um, I wish I could say I'm good enough to be able to pick, pick what's going to be the best bait site, but sometimes you have a good feeling and other times um, you're running those trials just so you can better understand where the pigs prefer to be. Uh, so use that to your advantage. Baiting it, baiting the trap for conditioning. Um, you know, the, the, the tool that we're using is bait and we're using that to help acclimate the pigs to the trap itself, right? So you, our goal is to create a conditioned response. Um, and so when you start thinking about where you're gonna position your trap, preferably you've done some bait trials, you understand that you have pigs coming in, you're using the data from your cameras, uh, you know how many that you're dealing with, uh, if you have your trap set up already because you know that there's pigs there and you've, you've done your feed trials, um, start with about 90% of the, the bait on the outside of the trap. You want your trap walls hiked up so that the pigs can get uh, in there and feed reliably once they're to the point where they're feeding on the outside of the trap heavily. Um, 
but you also want the bellies of the net low enough where they have to engage with the netting. You're going to condition those animals uh, to come to that bait and to engage with the trap. So that's going to be what your goal is. Um, as the pigs, you know, and it's when you set that trap up, it's not uncommon to have the pigs disappear for three, four days a week, right? You've introduced something new to their environment. So if you've done your bait trial, you know that you have pigs there. Um, you set the trap up, you bait on the outside, 90% of the corn on the outside. You don't want to force them to go on into the trap on the first few days. 10% uh, may be in the middle and let them move in at their own comfort. Um, but if the pigs disappear for a week, that's not uncommon, right? You've introduced something new to their environment and they're going to respond to that. Um, as they come back and start feeding more, start feeding into the trap, then you shift more of that bait uh, towards the center of the trap and under those bellies of the net um, as they become more comfortable. Uh, the, the total volume of bait during conditioning phase isn't as important as during the catch phase, um, but you want to make sure that everybody gets a little treat, right? If you have three sounders that are showing up, you don't want to put out just enough bait for the first sounder because you're going to discourage those other groups and they're going to find someplace else to feed. So you, you want enough volume that everybody's fed, but you don't want to put so much volume out there that you're going broke. You know, our, our preferred bait substance is whole corn, right? It's expensive now. There's no doubt about it. So uh, don't, don't run yourself broke doing your pre-bait. Um, save that for your, for your trap night. Uh, and then as you get closer to your trap, your catch phase, you're going to move all your bait to the inside of the trap, right? You're going to use some underneath the bellies of your net so that they have to engage with the netting, but the bulk of your bait is going to be in the center of the trap and they'll spread it around as the night goes on and you have more pigs in there. Um, one important aspect is, you know, bait at a consistent time. Generally, we prefer just before dark, right? That helps alleviate um, deer at our traps because what ends up happening is, is the deer will not like to feed there with pigs. And typically the pigs aren't gonna show up until dark. So if you're consistent with that timing, um, it'll help you to alleviate some of the non-target issues. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, whatever you did, whatever, whatever pattern you set, you need to keep that up, right? Use the same vehicle, right? So if it's your favorite pickup that you're gonna bait in, use that pickup all the time. Um, if you're going to use your side-by-side, -side, use that. If the radio's on in either one of them, leave the radio on. Um, if your best friend rides with you or your kids ride with you to go set the trap, uh, do your best to make sure that they go with you each time. Um, generally, we don't recommend taking your dog with you, um, especially if, if the neighbors or you run pigs with uh, hounds. Um, that's going to put the pigs off. So General, generally, we, we're not encouraging people to, to take pets out around the traps, but, um, you know, whatever you do, try to keep that as consistent as possible. And then bait the trap to catch, you know, stay consistent on how you bait and use the same bait. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our preferred bait is whole, whole shelled corn. Um, it's extremely weather durable and generally it's been cheap when you compare it to other bait sources. Uh, bait at the same time as during conditioning. So uh, when you go out there to set your trap, you want almost everything to be exactly the same. That means if you're going out there during conditioning, I'll go through and I'll touch all my cam straps. I'll take one walk around the trap itself and I'll touch the cam straps. I'll touch the netting, right? It's You've conditioned those animals to your smell through your baiting process. And the less things that, that are novel when you set, the, best you're, the better off you're going to be. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to go in there and touch things um, because when you set the trap, you're going to be touching things. And so, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort to walk around and handle the cam straps or grab the netting or, you know, touch your ground anchors, stakes, um, because those are going to be all things that you're going to do when you're setting the trap. Use the same equipment and use the same noise you know, it's not going to be exactly the same because the duration of time that you spend when you're setting the trap is going to be slightly longer. But whatever that is, if you leave the truck on with the radio running, when you set the trap, leave the truck on with the radio running. Um, and then obviously place all the bait in the trap, right? 
we want the pigs to have to commit to the trap um, when it's set. And if you've done an appropriate amount of conditioning where the pigs are comfortable underneath there, they've engaged with the netting, um, there's no reason why they shouldn't push in. And then the amount of bait during the catch phase is dependent on the number of pigs visiting the trap. You know, that's going to be related back to you on based on your camera data. If you're not using camera data, then generally what we do is we overbait the trap, right? So you put enough corn in there where you're not going to worry about running out of corn. And generally we're looking at about four pounds per pig for the trap night. You know, so if you have 20 pigs, you're going to use roughly you know, 80 pounds of corn, you're going to shake out two bags, right? You're going to put it right in the center. You're going to require them to commit to the trap before um, they get the tree to get some of the bait. Bait selections. Um, the KISS method, keep it simple, right? Uh, for us, it's whole shelled corn. Um, you know, if you look at any of the scientific studies, there's never been one that's proven that there's anything better than whole shell corn. There may be some very slight regional preferences, but when you look on a broad landscape, um, feral pigs prefer whole corn over just about anything else. Um, so, you know, for us, it's an extremely durable bait. It can take quite a bit of rain without spoiling, uh, relatively easy to transport. And then in, in the past, it's been relatively cheap. So um, that's important. If you're uh, fermenting up a concoction, right? Typically we try to avoid, you know, recipes that we can't repeat. You want, you want the most consistency as possible. So try to come up, if you've got a standard recipe that you're using to ferment, stick with that recipe. If it's, you know, uh, two packets of yeast and two boxes of strawberry jello, make sure that you use Two boxes or two packets of yeast and two boxes of strawberry jello on every batch that you make. Um, and because consistency is the key, right? That's I'm going to reinforce that a million times during this presentation. Whatever you do, be consistent about it. Um, and, and if the pigs aren't responding the way uh, you expect them to, the best thing to do is figure out why, right? Understand why they're not why they're not responding the way you anticipate. Um, and then if you can match the local diet at the time of baiting, right? We talked about this earlier, if um, they're harvesting peanuts and you have the ability to get, you know, um, cull peanuts from the local farmer, it makes good sense to use peanuts, right? Um, and sometimes that's as little as, you know, like our projects on Guam, where you're using a little bit of uh, coconut milk on the bait to get them to trans transition over to, to whole shell corn, right? So, so kind of think about what's on locally. You know, if you have bumper acorn crops, set out acorn traps, right? You have a boatload of acorns and you may not want to um, feed those while the acorns are falling because you're going to have a hard time catching pigs during that time, time period. But if you save those until a little later in the season, you're going to have a lot of bait leverage. Right, you're going to be the only one in the woods with a bunch of acorns, and, and pigs really like acorns, so um, that's going to help you out. Uh, we don't generally recommend using attractants, right? Um, there hasn't been any data, you know, when you look at scientific studies that are attractants are that of value. Um, doesn't mean that people haven't found value in them. It's just when we look at broad landscapes on a scientific basis that. Um, they just don't add a lot of advantage over whole corn. But if you're using them, continue to use them and be consistent, right? So, um, you know, if you're using one of the licorice-based products that seems to be popular, uh, stick with it. Don't, don't, don't deviate. So if you start with that, keep it up. Um, and then this is important, no diesel, right? Um, typically, when people talk about diesel, it's to keep non-targets off. We have other solutions for that. Um, diesel can be a point source pollution, right? And then you're contaminating the meat. So um, I know a lot of places that, you know, the carcasses are just recycled, but you don't want all the scavengers being, you know, uh, contaminated with additional diesel tainted meat. So um, please, no, di no, no, no diesel. 
and we'll talk about the, the next webinar, we'll talk about mitigation strategies for non-target. So if that's why you're using the diesel, um, we've got other strategies that you can use. So check in the next webinar in October. Baits of different flavors, you know, research shows that dry corn's the best, right? Um, there's no preference for other commercially developed baits. Um, you know, there, we'll admit that there are slight regional preferences, um, but given enough time, whole shell corn uh, works great. The downfall of whole shell corn is everything likes it, right? Raccoons like it, the deer like it, bears like it. So we need to use some sort of mitigation strategies when those non-targets are, are persistent. And um, like I said, we'll get, get to that in, in the next webinar and then just be aware of local diets, right? If you need a little extra advantage, use those, a little bit of peanut oil on your bait, you know, something that's similar to the peanut crop or you, know, you can use coconut milk, that's another one. Other bait options? Fermented grains, distilled grains, peanuts, soybeans, um, vegetables, pastries, all of these things will work, right? It's, it's what do you have access to? What's cheap? Be consistent. Um, and then, you know, how durable is it in the environment? It's like the problem with picking up restaurant slop is that it's not durable in the environment. So if your pigs disappear for a couple of days, you have a bunch of rotting stuff out there that eventually nothing will eat. So, um, and then oil rubs are another thing. Um, none of the projects that I've worked on, they've used oil rubs very effectively, but um, I think in some of the places where ectoparasite levels are high, oil rubs can be extremely effective, right? You put out a, a oil soaked rag with a, um, a biological based oil, peanut oil, some, some sort of vegetable based oil. Um, and the pigs will rub on that uh, to be able to re reduce their ectoparasite load, especially if it's dry, um, because they won't be able to wallow in mud. So um, those can be effective, placed near the trap, gets them into the area, they're going to use it, and then you can transition them over to your bait site. So uh, something to consider and think about. And then extras in the recipe. Um, we don't, generally we don't recommend using the attractants, right? Um, but why do you think you need them? I mean, that's what it all comes down to, right? And then do you really need them? You know, there may be some specific instances, like I'll say Guam's one of them, um, where we found that the pigs will show up the bait, knock on the bait quicker if you're using a little bit of coconut milk. Um, so, there, there can be instances where they have, they give you a slight advantage, but in general, you know, you're sending dollars out the door that you really don't need to. Um, but if you're using, if you're using an attractant, only use gel-based attractants in the cooler months when, uh, when fire ants are not active, right? Anything that's got a little bit of water in it um, in those warmer months, once the, once the fire ants get established, it's going to dramatically reduce feeding by pigs and just about anything else. So, you know, only do only or I'm sorry, only use gel based in the cooler months. In the summer, um, the fire ants will be attracted to that water in the gel based, and and you know it'll it'll put your pigs off. So, uh, during those warmer months, use powder based attractants if you're going to use them. And then if your pigs, you know, if you've been using shell corn and your pigs quit feeding. Before you start altering the bait, try to figure out why, right? Did the neighbor blow them up because they were running dogs two nights ago? Um, did, a, did one of your neighbors trap them? Are the pigs gone? Did they just transition to a different area? Um, something happened to, to disrupt those animals. And, you know, it's beneficial to understand why before you start making a lot of changes. And then closing reminders. Um, good conditioning is going to lead to your best catches. What we find is that people aren't as patient enough. So when you start getting partial catches, generally it's because you haven't done enough conditioning, right? Not all the pigs are conditioned to the point where they're comfortable in the trap. And we all can fall into that mindset that, you know, you got 75% of the pigs in there and they're super comfortable and 
you want to ignore that one sow that's on the outside edge of the trap that just doesn't seem to go in. Eventually she goes in. Um, and you have to be patient enough to catch her because if you don't get her on the first set, how are you going to get her in there? Um, so, you know, make sure you do an adequate amount of conditioning. You know, it's, I do a lot of deer work as well. And we find that it takes 21 days for us to be reasonably certain that we're interacting with all deer in an area, right? 21 days. So I'm not saying that it's going to, you're going to have to spend 21 days to, to make a successful catch with pigs. Um, but you have, you have to be patient and long enough um, to be able to make sure that every pig's going into the trap and they're, and they're um, comfortable in there. You know, you don't, you don't want them going in, but looking to bolt that in, anytime anything weird happens, you want to see them comfortable and you'll, you'll notice it'll, they'll be laying down on the bait. They'll, you know, nobody's standing back with their ears perked up. Um, be patient, be consistent, let your pigs guide the process, right? If they're comfortable feeding on the outside of the trap, but are still hesitant going in, um, you know, just give them some time slowly transition them into the center of the trap, right? You slowly transition from 90% of the bait on the outside and 10% in the middle to all the bait in the middle. Make that a, a slow transition process. And no two properties are the same in feral pig control, right? There's broad similarities between most properties. Um, a lot of the, the techniques hold true, right? You don't want to really drop the bait in their kitchen or in their bedroom. Um, you want to try to get it in transition zones, but no two properties are the same. So use the data at your disposal to best understand how to manage pigs on that specific property. And even on the same property, two different areas on the property, if it's large enough, pigs can behave differently um, just because outside pressure that are they're proximate to where they're at. So um, those are a few things to think about. Um, We've got a bunch of upcoming webinars here. Uh, the next one is probably the second most uh, frequently asked topic that we have, and that's on avoiding non-target species at the trap. Um, if you guys had questions during this, I encourage you to go ahead and drop some questions in the Q&A. Me and Marshall will be happy to, to go through uh, and answer questions that you guys have this evening. I'm not sure what the time is, but it's 8.40. Um, I think we're going to do the poll real quick before oh, okay. we go yep. to Q&A. Um, I do want to real quick want to touch on a couple of things that that you stated um, and just add to it. Um, the first, when, when we're saying keep your vehicle running, talk. If you're if you pulled up there and you're talking on the phone, just talk, um, sing a song, something just to to keep being consistent with how you approach that trap every time you put bait in there and the pigs will start to associate you just like they do a feeder when that spinner plate kicks off and it's sending out corn they'll come they'll show up probably before you can get back to the gate on your property um uh to the to the trap to start eating um when the they're coming to bait on a regular basis um another thing um is with the diesel um soaked corn um it it will make the pig sick uh and and the deer sick and so if you're using that you will the, over time the pigs will will you know avert that bait because it's made them sick just like with us if we eat something that makes us sick we're going to be less apt to eat that same food again because last time we ate it we got sick I guess I, I, that, that does bring up another point. You had mentioned the, the sound of a spin feeder. And generally, we recommend you hand feeding, right? Um, yeah. We do have people that successfully use spin feeders or gravity feeders uh, in our traps. But in general, part of the conditioning process is getting those pigs to acclimate to your scent and smell so that there's no aversion um, on trap night. So if you think about going through and running a spin feeder most of the time. Uh, it's a new event when you show up and go out there to set the trap because there's new smell all over the place. And so yeah. what, what we find over time is that we're more successful if we're hand feeding. 
you know, some places that's just not realistic and we understand that. So you're going to want to put some sort of um, containment device on the bottom of your feet or a, a rodent proof device or something so that the corn drops straight down if you have a spin feeder, right? You're going to want it to drop right down in the center of your tra trap and also make sure that you stake it down extremely well, right? You get a bunch of, you get 20, 20 pigs in there that average maybe 80 pounds thrashing around, they knock over the trap, lay one side of the trap down and you've lost your whole catch. Um, we've seen that. So uh, if you're going to use a, if you're going to use like a tripod feeder in there, just make sure that it's staked down extremely well. Yeah, and support those legs with, with T post or something. Um, Jason Moore uh, asked, what about trying to ferment, ferment your shelled corn? I was told to use yeast and sugar to create fermented corn in order to deter the, the deer and raccoons from eating my bait. Yeah, I mean, fermenting is definitely one of the techniques that we use to help mitigate non-targets, right? And so fermenting is totally acceptable. That's another step in the process. So if you're dealing with non-targets, um, fermenting, if you're at low densities, is a great way to do that. And so uh, generally, you don't need to put additives in there to ferment it. Um, I think in Texas, they can ferment corn in like three days just by putting it out in the sun. You don't need to add extra yeast. You don't need to add beer. You don't need to add gel. You don't need to add any of those things. If you're doing here, it, we have to, here we have to add yeast and sugar. If you yeah. just put yeast alone, it won't, uh, there's not enough sugars in the corn or you have to let it sit for longer before so, it'll permit. Yep. So in general, if you're doing that, just be consistent on whatever you're doing. If you're using a cup of sugar and, you know, two packets of yeast, used to, you know, use, use the same formula over and over again. But yeah, definitely using fermented corn. And then um, I was going to try to avoid going into it too much tonight because Aaron will cover a lot of this on, on the webinar next time. But, um, you know, fermenting hat helps at reasonable or lower non-target densities. The, tar the non-target densities increase. You can uh, ferment like a pound of rice bran into a five gallon bucket of uh, fermented corn. Um, and you'll know when it's fermented, it, it smells god awful. You don't want it rotten, but um, that works really well to, to help push the deer off even a little more. Um, and I think that they've seen some resistance to uh, bears with the yeast or the rice bran fermented in there. And so, um, that's another technique. And like I said, Aaron will go over the, the non-target stuff, but generally when we're thinking about fermenting, it's because we're, we're trying to leverage the fermentation process to make it less palatable to our non-targets. So generally that's what we're using the fermenting process for. It's not for the smell of an attractant or anything. It's really to help mitigate those non-targets. Um. Jason asks again, can I try can I try to trap pigs during deer season? I'm concerned about getting deer uh, snared in the netting. Um, yes, you can um, trap during deer season. Um, what we recommend is you have the net all the way up and when you have pigs comfortable going in, um, you go all the way down. Don't don't slowly gradually lower or don't go halfway then down, go from all the way up and drop it all the way catch mode. Um, so that way with the bucks having antlers, there's uh, less of a chance of them trying to crawl under, they'll pace around it or they'll try to jump over and in than trying to crawl underneath. And I think that this, I mean, this brings back up, we're, we're talking a lot about the non-targets, but you know, you're going to want to treat your bait with liquid fence, right? We've got a, a blog post on that, how to do it. Um, but, you know, when you treat your dry corn with liquid fence, it keeps the deer off. So, you know, if you're going to do that and you're worried about deer because you're, you know, putting your trap out on a deer lease or something, um, yeah, you're, you're going to want to use liquid fence to, to topically treat your corn um, good idea to go from, you know, straight up uh, conditioning mode all the way down and not transition somewhere in the middle, like you said. Um, I think Aaron's doing some work with using electric fencing to, to keep the deer from trying to jump over the top of the trap too, and I'm sure he'll cover some of that next month. But 
yeah, definitely. Um, our risk months really for uh, entanglement would be, you know, when the when the bucks are polishing their antlers. So, you know, basically now as they're coming out of velvet and then when they start really getting riled up for rut, right? It's like they're pushing yeah. on stuff and getting jammed up into stuff. If you can avoid it, it's generally best to, to avoid that time of year. Not that you can't catch pigs then, um, but you're also competing with everybody who's got corn out for, you know, attracting deer in the, the states that it's legal to bait, which is most of the states that we have pig problems in, right? And yeah. so uh, generally that's a good time of year to, to focus on your deer hunting and, and less on your, your pig hunting um, or pig trapping. And so, uh, you know, our, our baseline recommendation is to just avoid that time of year. But if you can't do that, then use some of these other mitigation strategies and, and that'll help you out. And, it, you know, it's like, I'm not going to say that we haven't had deer entangled in the netting, but you look at how many trap nights we have um, from our customers and it's in the hundreds of thousands of trap nights. And we've had what, maybe four deer entangled, five deer entangled? Four or five, um, yes. And I think we've only had one death because of it, right? And right. so when you look at like the risk of entanglement, um, yep, definitely 100%, there's a risk there, right? Deer get themselves tangled up in Christmas tree lights, <laughs> uh, soccer nets, anything you can possibly think of for them to get caught in fences. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many deer have been pulled out of fences on projects that I've worked on. Um, so yeah, it's a risk. Um, there's ways to mitigate it and, and certainly tune in to the October webinar where, where uh, Aaron talks about this because it's super important if you plan on trapping during deer season. All right, this one comes from Kevin Anderton. My pigs are inconsistent, always on, on the property, uh, 1,200 acres, but didn't hit the bait consistently. Can you recommend anything? I'm I'm having the same issue on a property that I'm trapping, and the the best thing is just be patient. Um, I know that that's easier said than done. Um, just be patient and be consistent. And you know, as as I'm in the the northern part of the Midwest, right? Acorns are just starting to drop now. Like we're just, you know, maybe they're even early aborts, but like they're just starting to drop you're heading into a really rough stretch on trying to trap, right? It's like, and deer season's starting. In New Jersey, I think they're deer hunting already. So they've got corn on the ground. So when you think about, you know, the amount of effort that you're willing to pet, put in to, to your trapping effort, um, you know, you don't have to be stubborn and push all the way through deer season here um, or, the, or the time in the fall when there's tons of, tons of natural resources available, right? The hickories are falling like crazy up here. I'm sure that the same is happening down there. The pecans are probably dropping. Um, They're starting to drop, yeah. Yeah, and so that's gonna really hamper your ability to be super successful with the trap. So it's not out of the realm of possibility to just hang your trap up for a couple months, right? It's frustrating um, and you don't wanna do it. And, and I totally get it, um, but that might be the best strategy right? Is to just take a break, let the natural food re resources get cleaned up, any of the spilled grain and any of the agricultural fields get, get cleaned up, wait for the bulk of the deer hunters to get out of the woods, and then really get serious about focusing on pig trapping, right? And then it's because you're going to be in the, the best time of the year, and you're going to want to put the pedal to the metal and, and make hay while the sun's shining, right? You're going to push it just as hard as you can, almost until March, right? At least in, in most of the, what we call bacon belt, right? And those Southern tier states that, um, you know, you're, you're probably getting green up in late February, early March, your trapping success starts to wane. But, you know, in those hard pressed months when there's not a lot of food resource available from mother nature and there's not much spilled grain out there and the deer hunters are out of the woods, that's when you really, you know, you, you know, you need to make the, make hay while the sun's shining. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from Ken Miller. How long should you ferment your corn? It all depends on the temperature, right? It's like, and, and, and I, I want to say the yeast will stop working at below 55. 
um, like it'll go dormant. Um, and then once temperatures are above 55, it'll start uh, breaking down sugars again. Um, I so, think generally like Texas is about three days is what they look for. And like I said, I'm in the upper Midwest and, you know, we're looking at five to seven days to actually really ferment corn. Um, and so a, a lot of it just depends on the area. You want, it be a, you want it to be out in the sun where it can get as much solar radiation as possible to get the heat up. Right. So if you're if you're trying to ferment, make sure it's in a sunny location, make sure it's covered, right? To hold to trap as much of that heat as possible and try to keep it out of the shade as, as much as you can, and that'll speed up your fermentation process. Uh Jason Moore asked, are you saying to mix the rice bran in with the shelled corn uh that is being fermented? Yep. Yep. It's one it, I'm pretty sure, uh, and Aaron will go over this and I, uh, on the webinar, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a one pound per five gallon buckets. And so you mix the rice bran right in there. You add your water, stir it all together and let her get fermented all in, in one batch. And it's, I, I haven't done it myself, so I can't, I can't guarantee you what it smells like, but if Aaron says it stinks, it really it's, stinks. It's bad. Yep. Uh, like gag and maggot bad. Yep. And he's, he said that the one thing that you have to be careful of is you don't want to go too far on that, right? You want it to be fermented and you'll, he said, you'll know, um, but you don't want it to, to become rotten. And so it's the, and, and I'm almost positive the formula is one pound of rice bran per five gallon bucket of your, your typical brew, right? Whatever your ratio is. And, you know, generally when I look at fermenting, you're looking at, and, and it's, you know, a little over three quarters of a bucket of shelled corn, maybe as much as seven eighths, and then fill it up to the top with water. And then if the first day it sucks up all the water and you look in your bucket, you add a little bit more left, right? Yeah. Um, he asked again, when I put out my shelled corn, should I make piles of bait or spread it around more evenly? Um, when you're conditioning, I would I would broadcast it um, out around um, and like we say, uh, ninety percent of your bait outside, ten percent inside. When you go to catch mode, that's when you're going to want a hundred percent of your bait piled in the middle of the trap. And I think it's to to clarify that it's a transition from ninety percent sprayed outside to a hundred percent piled in the center, right? It's like you're not going abruptly from one to the other. It's a transition. Once they're feeding inside the trap, you're totally fine to pile it right in the center of the trap. Yes. First group of pigs that comes in there, they're going to spread it around anyways, right? They're going to end up standing in it and moving in it, and some of them sleep in it. Um, so they're going to push it around a little bit. But when you start out, it's a good idea to spread that out so that that helps every pig be able to feed on that bait, right? You're not you, they're not competing for one little pile. And especially if you've got a couple different boars in there that aren't gonna like each other too much, um, it gives them the ability to have a little bit of space and they're not you know, running each other off as much. Uh, Kevin asks again, do I need to move, move the trap after a capture? Nope. I mean, again, we allow the, the pigs to tell us what to do, but generally we're looking at our, our camera data, right? Um, if you've got 16 pigs on camera, you set the trap and you caught 16 pigs, then we'll end up picking it back up, putting it in conditioning mode, baiting it and seeing what happens. Um, if for some reason you missed a couple pigs during your catch, literally we'll set the, we'll set the trap the very next day. It'll be set, it'll be set again um, and we'll see if we pick up those, those pigs and, and we'll give it two days. Um, generally is what we're looking at. So you make your catch, set it for another two days, those other pigs don't show up, then we'll lift up the skirt and start reconditioning, right? We'll go back to the point where we're putting 90% sprayed around the outside of the trap. We may end up running some bait lines out. So basically just taking a bag of corn, cutting the corner off one of the bags and walking it out maybe 50, 75 yards, right? spread that bait out in a, a large enough area where if a pig's coming by, they're likely to tee into your bait lines. Um, 
and then just start conditioning in the next group of pigs. And certainly if you're running, mul if you've got one trap and you're running 5,000 acres and you've got multiple areas that you're trying to get the trap to, um, you know, if I had that trap and I had 16 pigs coming in and I caught all 16, uh, I'd be dropping that trap and moving it someplace else for another catch. But that's assuming that you've already done bait trials there and you've got some place to go with it. If you're only moving it because you're afraid that pigs won't come back to that area, that's not a good reason to move the trap. We just don't see that. And if you think about the fact that pigs will feed on carrion, right? I mean, early on in my trapping uh, days out on Catalina Island, um, a lot of our traps were in super remote areas. And it's like, you maybe check in 10 or 12 traps a day and you might be hiking, I don't know, close to 20 miles through, you know, mountainous terrain. It's like, by the time you got to the last traps, you were pretty well spanked. You weren't dragging big fat pigs too far, right? It was like, you were trying to get them just out of view of the stinking trap. And we'd frequently come back and see that pigs have fed on the, the carcasses, right? They were, um, you know, basically feeding on their brother. And so when you think about it from that aspect, it's not likely that, that the smell of blood or, um, you know, carrion is gonna put the pigs off. Generally, just, I, and I don't know exactly even why we do it, but we'll take a little bit of dirt, right? Especially if the dirt's loose, kick it over any of the big blood spots. Um, you know, if there's fecal material in there, it doesn't hurt to scoop it out. So it's not right in there, but pigs wallow in their own crap, right? It's like, you know, you look at pig walls. So um, it's, it's occasionally the pigs will not want to come back to it, but that's, that's a very, very rare occurrence. Generally, they'll be right back. Um, real quick, guys, we have um, a poll that we we're wanting to um, ask you guys that, that are in attendance. Um, if y'all wouldn't mind taking that real quick um, and while you're looking over it, if you got any more questions, shoot them over into the Q and A and Ryan and I will, will be happy to answer those for you. And generally this is just to give us an idea of um, what you guys are using for bait. Like, are you using feeders or are you hand feeding? Do you use attractants? Are you using any mitigation strategies for non-targets? Um, and this just really gives us a better sense of, you know, who we're talking to and what is valuable to you guys and what we really need to focus on, right? Um, basically, it just helps us. It, it, it helps us better uh, be able to serve you and understand, you know, kind of what our customers are, are doing and using. Uh, Jason said he had, uh, he's in the mountains of Western North Carolina, and that he had uh, a black bear haul off uh, his buckets of fermented corn. Yeah, that'll happen. I mean, um, bears can be crazy. It's like, would we typically, I guess North Carolina, we do get some complaints from North Carolina. Arkansas is the big one. Right. It's like you seems like we're frequently getting pictures from Arkansas where they're crawling over the, the net itself. Um, that's one thing about bears. They generally seem to be pretty good about getting in and out of the trap without too many issues of damaging it. Um, I think I, I had the worst bear damage of anybody. Like almost the only one. Yeah. The, well, yeah, the only one uh, uh -huh. that was a pain in the butt sow. Yep. But I, I think... Aaron's going to present some new research that they're doing um, that looks very, very promising for bears. So uh, you definitely want to tune into that. And I'd only, he had, he's just, he flew to Argentina and that's the reason he's not presenting tonight. Um, but he just kind of gave me a real brief overview of it. Uh, excuse me, before he headed out. And so uh, I'm going to be in attendance on October. Uh, webinar just just so I can get the update on that. I'm not sure I'll have a chance to talk to him before then. So um, that'll be real interesting information, especially for the folks there in Arkansas, North Carolina, some of the areas. I guess Georgia, because you're dealing with bears down there frequently. You have, where I'm at, it's it's rare. Um, they'll come up out of the swamps like we've had all this rain and crap, 
um, that's been going on. Uh, it pushes them up out of some of these swampy areas. Um, for the past five years, we've actually had one come into the Valdosta city limits. Um, and I get calls like crazy. People are like, can you come shoot it? No, I can't touch it. Call the game warden. Uh, Jason said the black bear hauled off six five-gallon buckets. I bet that thing had a splitting headache. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to want to check that out. And I think, I think he was. I, I don't know what the ratio was, but I think he they were using cayenne pepper, and I think that the, the it was uh, capsaicin, pure capsaicin. capsaicin. And yeah. I want to. It was. It wasn't very much, um, and it completely deterred them. Um, and the pigs, uh, the pigs and deer both ate it. So it sounds like it'll be capsaicin, topically dressed with liquid fence. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it would should come with a very strong, harsh warning. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be wiping your eyes or using the restroom in the woods, right? or downwind of that when you're spraying it. I worked on a training at one point where they were, you know, using bear spray and the, the person putting it on, I don't know if they were new or what, but it wasn't paying attention. You know, we had this whole group of us, I don't know, there's eight or 10 and camp was kind of downwind of us and they were showing us how to do it and cut off with the bear spray canister and, oh dude. <laughs> <laughs> and smoked all of us in the thing, blew through camp, ran the camp cookout. Oh, it was it was it was a nightmare. So, anyways, yeah, that 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 stuff's bad. I get it. it it'll have you crying, nose running. I mean, did we uh, did we cover everything in the Q and A? Yeah, um, guys, if y'all have more questions, um, shoot them to us. Uh, we're at your disposal. I think we're running we're running about an hour which is about what we'd like to keep these two don't want to keep you too late um i think sounds like looks like the poll questions have wrapped up we'll kind of yeah. tally those and um maybe we get them all compiled maybe we'll post those in the um, facebook owners group that might be a good good place to kind of kind of put it out there so people can see what other people are doing and we've got a Good understanding of that. Um, anything else you need to cover this evening, Marshall? No, that's we we covered it pretty good. Well, certainly. Great. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to our speakers for your time and preparation. And we also want to thank all of our attendees. You guys had some great questions. The recording of this webinar is going to be sent out in the next few days, so please keep an eye on your inbox. We'll also email you about other upcoming webinars, which is also what the slide is up right now. So be sure that you're on our email list. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day or night. Good night, guys. Thank you, everyone.